Now, let me start this out with a couple very obvious statements. First, there will be spoilers for both Black Panther and Aquaman in this video, and I say that mostly for the sake of those who may not have seen Aquaman yet, since it's by far the newer of the two releases. Second, these two movies are of course not identical, but the number of similarities between them is rather striking when you really stop and think about it. They're even so similar that they have the exact same audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, a 79, which could lead one to make the assumption that, on average, people feel about the same in regards to these two movies, and both have done extremely well at the box office to reflect the fact that people have enjoyed both of them, with Black Panther pulling in $1.34 billion worldwide, and Aquaman having made $1.06 billion thus far, though it's still going. However, critics have felt vastly different about these two movies, with Aquaman getting a 64 on Rotten Tomatoes, while Black Panther has gotten an impressive 97, and is currently ranked as the best superhero movie of all time on their site. And before we discuss why that's the case, let's take a quick look at just some of the ways these movies are so similar. Starting with the basic premise of both films, which is almost identical, because in both cases you have an ancient, highly advanced civilization that has kept itself isolated and secret from the rest of the world, or at least they've kept the extent of their technology secret, which is the case with Wakanda, since the country is known of, while Atlantis is thought of as just a myth by most people, though some do believe it exists. Both movies then more or less open with scenes involving a member of a royal family. For Aquaman, it's Atlanta, and with Black Panther, it's Najobu, who have left their nation and, for one reason or another, chosen to side with or live in the outside world. Both these royal family members apparently find love and have a child. Both these wayward royal family members are then confronted by their people in an attempt to bring them back, and both end up killed, or in the case of Atlanta and Aquaman, presumed killed, which of course leaves both Arthur and Killmonger resentful towards their own people. The rest of the movie in both cases, to put it very, very simply, are then about these outcasts trying to claim the throne of their respective kingdoms. Though yes, one is of course the villain of their story, while the other is the hero. Nevertheless, the setups and premise for these two movies are almost exactly the same. Furthermore, everything about the nations of Wakanda and Atlantis are almost the same, other than the fact that one is underwater. Both split off and became hidden from the rest of the world a long time ago. Both are made up of five tribes or kingdoms, and have one tribe or kingdom that is separated from the rest in some respect, and become like outcasts. In the case of Wakanda, it's the Jabari tribe, while in Aquaman, it's the Trench. And by the end of the movie, both these lost tribes will play a key role in our heroes saving the day. In Wakanda, then, the ruler of these five tribes is known as the Black Panther, and before becoming as such, the rightful heir can be challenged by any of the other tribe leaders, or by any member of the royal family, while in Atlantis, the ruler of the five kingdoms is known as the Ocean Master, King of Atlantis, and Master of the Seven Seas and they too can be challenged by the leaders of the other kingdoms, or by other members of the royal family. And, of course, in both movies, such a challenge occurs, and a battle for the throne is had between our main protagonist and main antagonist, which, to no one's surprise, leads to our protagonist losing in both cases, and being essentially chased off or thought dead. This then tests the allegiance of many of the other characters, forcing them to pick between their loyalty to the crown itself, or their friend, which brings us to the love interest in both movies, those being Nakia in Black Panther and Mera in Aquaman. And again, these two are similar in almost every way. Because both are intelligent, stubborn, very capable in a fight, and spend most of the movie fighting or denying their feelings for our hero until the very end. Both are only interested in serving the greater good, and both at one point help save a family member or members of the hero's family, with Mara helping save Arthur's father from a tsunami, and Nakia helping to get T'Challa's mother and sister out of Wakanda after Killmonger comes to power. Then we move on to our main villains, Killmonger and King Orm, and both have, you guessed it, the exact same primary goal. They want to rule their kingdoms and start a war with the outside world, and they both even go about trying to rise to power or take the throne in very similar ways with plans that involve using what you could call the B-level villains, those being Black Manta and Claw. Orm uses Black Manta to steal a submarine so he can launch a supposed surprise attack from the surface world during a meeting of the kings, thus uniting all the kingdoms under him so that he can take them to war. Killmonger is a bit harsher, and first uses Claw to steal Vibranium and get Wakanda's attention, then kills Claw and uses his death to gain access to Wakanda, and to prove to the people that he can do what T'Challa cannot do, and that is to bring justice to Claw for crimes committed against Wakanda. 
Now, there are many other similarities between these two movies. Some are just silly and fun, like the fact that one has war rhinos and the other has war sharks. Others involve poorly disguised foreshadowing about how the villain would ultimately be defeated. In the case of Black Panther, it was an expository scene about how the train system that transported the vibranium out of the mountain worked, which would have been completely unnecessary unless Black Panther ultimately used that info to defeat Killmonger, which he did. And in Aquaman, it was the scene where Volko shows Arthur the spinning trident trick, which he'd eventually use to defeat Orm. Okay, so why are these movies so similar then? Did DC see the success of Black Panther and try to make a movie to copy it? No, that's highly unlikely. Aquaman was in production even before Black Panther came out, so unless there was some major script changes and reshoots, Black Panther had no bearing on what Aquaman turned out to be. So was it just an incredible coincidence then that these two movies would end up so similar? Well, yeah, some of the finer details that line up are likely just a coincidence. But the reality is, the premise of these two stories lining up so closely can be chalked up to the fact that this is hardly a new or original premise for a story. The whole idea of someone with royal lineage who has some claim to the throne but was either exiled or thought lost or whose existence was never even known about that suddenly re-emerges to challenges the sitting ruler is actually one of the oldest story plots around and it's been done time and time again. Black Panther and Aquaman are so similar because they both use the exact same story. The only real major difference between them is in one case the villain is the one seeking the throne, and in the other it's the hero trying to claim it. That's it. That's all that separates the core of these two stories. And no, neither movie really puts any type of new twist or spin on an old concept. Yet, despite that, you have critics who praised Black Panther for breathing fresh air or life into the stale superhero genre, or being something completely different from the norm when actually it's really not all that much different from the first Thor movie, where Thor, the rightful heir, gets tricked by his brother and cast out, thus opening the door for Loki to briefly take the throne and almost start a war, just like how Black Panther briefly gets ousted and Killmonger takes the throne and almost starts a war. As I said, this is hardly a new concept for a story. Black Panther and Aquaman just happened to do it in an even more similar way than most and also came out relatively close to each other, which leads us back to the initial question. Why does the audience rate these two movies the same, while well, critics think Black Panther is far and away the superior movie, and it even finds itself, according to Rotten Tomatoes, rated the best superhero movie of all time? Well, if you click on the reviews for both to see why critics favored one more than the other, for Aquaman, most of them just talk about the movie itself, the good and the bad, and render a final verdict, which are what film critics are supposed to do, I think we would all agree. While with Black Panther, there's a lot of talk about how important the movie is. But why? Why is a movie about a meteorite filled with magical metal crashing into Earth and then being discovered and used by an ancient civilization to become highly advanced important? Why is a story about a king coming to terms with the wrongdoings of his father important? Why is a story about a man who feels betrayed by his own people and now wants vengeance upon them, and the world itself, important? Again, other than the magical meteorite part, this is not a new story in any way, shape, or form. And I know, this is where some will accuse me of being racist because I don't see the obvious importance of a movie like Black Panther. And then I'm supposed to counter by saying, but I have black friends, so I can't be racist. But here's the thing, I don't have black friends. Now, some of my friends happen to be black, but I don't and never would call them black friends. I don't put anyone, much less my friends, in separate categories or judge them any differently, depending on the color of their skin or any other general characteristics like race, gender, sexuality, religion, and so on. It's absurd to me that such a general characteristic, shared by millions if not billions of people, should be used to define an individual in any way. For example, saying someone is a gay Asian man tells me absolutely nothing about that person's quality of character, what they're even remotely like or interested in, and they could be vastly different from someone else who shares those same three generic traits. And yet, the diversity craze nowadays seems to tell us that these general traits are more important than anything else, and that they can begin to tell us a great deal about the individual who has them, which to me sounds like the very epitome of racism, or sexism, or whatever other ism or phobia it might be. And this diversity belief has infected Hollywood and the critics who review their films. They've lost sight of the fact that just because you have a fictional character in a fictional story do something, or accomplish something, it doesn't actually say anything about an entire group of people outside of the movie. For good or bad, just because they share some of that main character's or hero's general characteristics. 
Oftentimes these days, it seems like Hollywood has forgotten that it's the struggle of the character we can relate to, because struggles are universal. Adversity is one of the things all people will face in their lives no matter who they are or what general characteristics they have. We will all have to pick ourselves back up and fight on at some point in our lives against something we think is greater than us. And that's pretty much the formula of every superhero movie ever made. A challenge greater than the hero arises, they initially lose to it, but find a way to overcome it and save the day in the end. And the way we can bond with or relate to these incredible and powerful characters is through their struggles. And when we see a hero in a story struggle or even get defeated, we realize that even the greatest amongst us can fall. But what makes them truly endearing characters, what actually makes them heroes, is not their powers. It's when they manage to persevere against all odds and rise above. Because we want to believe we can do the same when faced with our own problems and be the heroes of our own lives. And the reason why we watch superhero movies or movies like Star Wars is to be inspired by characters we can relate to. Not to see empowerment. Not to see someone who looks just like us easily win every fight they find themselves in. But to see someone we can connect with on a human level, despite whatever they might look like or whatever crazy powers they might have, overcome the greatest of challenges. And the reason why Black Panther is an important movie, and why a movie like Aquaman is also important, is because they are stories that show characters doing just that, where they overcome incredible challenges and save the day in the end, and learn something from the overall experience. They both were meant to be fun, yet also to inspire, and they both did just that. And personally, I enjoyed both of them quite a bit, and I don't know which one I prefer. And yes, you can certainly argue your reasons for why one is a better movie than the other, and Black Panther was more relevant to our real world, if you will. And my goal here was not to belittle any personal importance Black Panther may have had to you as an individual, but the key word there is individual. If it meant something to you, for whatever reason, I have no interest in taking that away from you. None. In fact, I'm glad it did, because I've had movies mean something to me before for my own personal reasons. However, my point here is that I don't think an overly fictional and fanciful movie of all things should ever represent or be meant to empower or be seen as some sort of symbol of importance to an entire group of people when it'd be virtually impossible to ever find even two people in the world, much less a large group of them, that agree on absolutely everything. Which means, how then could we ever find one singular thing to represent a massive group of people when true representation, which is what the diversity movement says it's all about, should only be about finding your own way to express yourself. Diversity should celebrate the fact that each and every one of us is different, not put us into categories of any kind. Because separating people into broad groups based on generic traits and expecting them to be similar sounds a lot more like uniformity, which is the opposite of diversity. And if you truly want to be represented in this world, then just be you and do your own thing. And if others don't like it, who cares? Don't let it destroy you. Don't let yourself be ruled by the disapproval of others and angered by those who don't share your views. And don't feel like you have the right or obligation to try and forcibly change the minds of others or police how they live when you don't want the same done to you. I mean, the first time I got a negative comment on YouTube in response to one of my videos, I didn't pack it up and call it quits, or try and pick a fight with them, and I'm sure I'll get my fair share of heat from some of the things I've said in this video. But guess what? It's okay if you disagree with me. It's okay if not everyone else in the world accepts my beliefs or opinions. I cherish the fact that I'm not exactly like anyone else on this planet, and I have no interest in being put into a category and being told the actions of others in my category or anything else for that matter, represents me. I represent me. My actions define me. And if some people don't want to accept me, that's okay. I'll embrace the fact that I have many friends and family that do, and I'll just go on being me. Well, that's all I've got for this time. And I know what you might be thinking. Thor, where in the hell did all this come from? Well, I don't really know. But if you made it this far, thanks for listening to me ramble. And if you don't 100% agree with everything I said, that's okay. Anyway, leave a comment below, and after this, let's get back to talking some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.